uh, from Japan, and another one is Sanura Ganshu from Berkeley. And I'm in Max Planck. And I guess I'm putting here a picture of Perimeter Institute because this is where we actually started working on this because both me and Anurag were postdocs there until this summer. And Tomotaka was, was visit, visiting us. So that's more or less when we were working on this. And this is the preprint in case you're interested. Okay, so let me just start from the very basic and very general question of the, well, the problem of quantum many body systems on the lattice, no? which I guess is usually called the, the quantum many body problem. No? So the setting is, is hopefully is clear to everyone. No, it's basically you have a, a Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian. Can you see the, the cursor, by the way, the arrow? Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you have a Hamiltonian, and the particular feature of it is that it's defined in terms of like a smaller, a smaller pieces, uh, smaller parts of the Hamiltonian, which have support only on certain subsystems, and the and this and this is such that the interaction graph is in so it has some geometric structure, no, and in particular some sort of lattice, no. Um, so this is, a, of course, this is a very physically important uh, object, no? And basically, understanding it is called the quantum many-body problem, no? And with this, I guess this is a very vague problem, no? It's not very clearly stated, but I guess I will, I will just summarize it as basically, you know, trying to understand the important features of these quantum many-particle systems, and also find ways of extracting the relevant numerical data, no? That then you can use for experiments, no? Okay. Uh, so why is this important? Well, it's very important for many reasons, no? I guess. And in particular, it touches upon a lot of different subjects, no? uh, some of which hopefully some of you care about. Uh, and basically, this problem has to do with quantum information, which is more the angle I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it has to do with quantum computation and complexity theory. No? Uh, the complexity of thermal states is, a, is an important subject within complexity theory itself. Of course, it has to do with condensed matter, no? because it's, it's a many-body many problem. No? Uh, with high-energy physics, in the sense that high-energy physics also studies strongly correlated quantum systems. No? Uh, with quantum chemistry and possibly other things, no. And uh, well, hopefully, you know, it's understanding this this kind of many body Hamiltonian yields a lot of interesting and you know, both scientific and technological discoveries, no, in the future, no. And now you have all these nice experiments with coatoms, no, like the one. Well, this this picture here is meant to reproduce like a coatom experiment, no? and you have like a lot of nice experiments about this this kind of setting, no. So it's quite it's quite a timely subject to study now. But of course, it's a very it's a very hard it's a very hard problem, no. And and the naive reason is that the the Hilbert space of the, of the problem of the many behind Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian has, a, has a dimension that is exponential no? in the system size. So when you try to increase the system a little bit, then basically you cannot do you cannot do direct computations, no? So you cannot diagonalize matrices that are like you know two to the fifty or two to the hundred, no? Or maybe you can, but then you definitely cannot do two to the two hundred, no? So 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 the solution to this is you know I guess historically has been well very obvious, no? You have to understand the physics of this problem. And then once you understand the physics, hopefully you can find smart workarounds around this problem of you know having to do very, very naive computations, let's say, no. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about a couple of things. And I guess this, you know, we don't we don't care about all the states in Hilbert space, but we, we care especially about particular ones, no. And I will guess I would say that these two kinds are the perhaps the most important ones. No, I mean not the only important ones, but maybe some of the most important ones. No? One is of course the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And another one is the thermal state. No? So of course I'm going to talk about thermal states. Uh, and what do we want out of this? Uh, out of this, you know, potential solution of quantum many body problems. No, we want efficient ways of approximating them, thermal states and ground states. And these these ways of approximating them have to allow us to extract physical information, no, in the form of expectation values or fluctuations or something to do with the correlations in these states or any any physically relevant data. No? So. What 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 is a possible to, to to use to this is basically tensor networks, no? Which maybe many of you have you know have encountered before. So I don't I don't want to explain them too much in detail. I just want to just tell you that you know this how what what we usually use them for, no? Okay, so now actually before moving into thermal states, I want to talk a bit about uh, ground states and the situation of ground states, and in particular I want to talk about let's say the math the mathematical results that are known about the um, the complexity of approximating ground states with tensor networks. Okay. And then, and then by analogy with ground states, I will talk about the situation of thermal states. So this, um, this is a known fact from complex, complexity theory, from quantum complexity theory, which is that um, even in one dimension, approximating the energy of ground states is QMA hard. So QMA hard, for those that, that don't know this, is well, QMA is, the, is a complexity class, which is the analog of MP. So approximating the, the energy of, a, of an arbitrary one-dimensional Hamiltonian is hard, even for a quantum computer. No? 
but of course there's exceptions to this problem no? so you can find sub sub instances let's say you know sub classes of problems which are easier in particular the problem is much easier in one dimension when your hamiltonian has a gap and with gap i mean of course a, a, a finite energy gap between the ground state and the excited states no so so many more things are known about this about this case no in particular you know, there's, some, there's a really important one no? which is that the ground states of gap models obey an area law for the entanglement entropy this is a a uh, break, breakthrough result by Hastings in 2006. And then we also know that uh, states that have, a, that have a, an area law, so arbitrary quantum states that have an area law for entanglement entropy, can be faithfully, um, let's say, approximated by matrix product states. And matrix product states are tensor networks and they're a very, a very computationally simple object that you can, you know, you can work with. No? Uh, and I guess the other result I want to talk about, about uh, ground states, is that Actually, so you know, in, from these two papers, what you can guess is that there exists an NPS approximation, but you don't know how, you don't necessarily know how to find it in a in an efficient time. No, but actually, these people in 2013, 2014 actually proved that there exists an algorithm, and they give an explicit expression for this algorithm no? for approximating a, a ground state of, a, of an arbitrary 1D model gap with a gap with an NPS. Okay, so the picture that emerges out of all this is, is you know, I, I think I schematically I want I want to put it like this. So there's three different things and we, and we want to connect them. No? The first thing is the physical situation. The second thing is the correlations that stem out of this physical situation and then it's the algorithm. No? So in this case, uh, again, we have a Hamiltonian with a ground state. Uh, and the ground state has a, in, in one dimension and has an energy gap, no? meaning that the difference between the, the, um, the ground state and the first excited state is a constant and this constant does not decrease with system size. No? If this is the case, then we know that the uh, entropy has an area law, which is going to depend on the gap in some way. And, it's, uh, and this is a constant. I mean, area law means a constant in one dimension, of course, because uh, the area doesn't grow with system size. No? It's just a single bond. No? And we also know that from this fact, we can have algorithms. No? So we can have algorithms for uh, MPS representations of ground states that work in uh, actually converts in linear time, no? linear in the system size. Okay, and uh, yeah, I guess one important thing actually that sometimes is, is not emphasized is that uh, you need the, you don't need the area law for the for the von Neumann entanglement entropy, but actually you need it for the Rennie entanglement entropy and for for certain range of alphas. No, this is the definition of the Rennie entropy. Anyway, that's not so important for the rest of my talk. Okay, so now actually I want to I want to draw the picture which which holds and the picture that is known for thermal states. Okay, so actually now. Um, Many results are known even for any dimension, not just in one dimension. So we have the physical situation, which is that we have a Gibbs state, right? Uh, and then we have two, se two separate facts. No? One is that um, uh, the scenario law, this thermal state of an area law, and the quantity that we know by scenario law is the mutual information, which is going to be the, basically the quantity I'm going to be talking about for like at least half of this talk. No? Um, and this, this term here, it's basically the norm of the interaction Hamiltonian between two different parts. No? So I have, a, I have my system, I have a lattice, and I divide it into two subsystems, A and B, and I have a boundary. So I call this delta, you know, well, basically this quantity here. No? Uh, and the norm of this interaction Hamiltonian, of course, is going to scale like the boundary. No? So this is an area law. Another thing we know independently of the area law, actually, is that thermal states can be approximated with now not with a matrix product state, but with a matrix product operator, no? which is basically the, the mixed state analog of, of, a, of a matrix product state. No? I mean, look at if you remember this picture here, the difference between this and this is that now I have an extra, an extra leg here, which represents the, the fact that this is a mixed state now instead of a pure state. No? And also from, from these works, we know that there's a polynomial time algorithm to approximate thermal states in any dimension, actually. Uh, of course, the, the larger the dimension, the, the worse is going to scale this, this polynomial, no? But, uh, but there's a polynomial time algorithm, actually. Um, okay, and this is just the definition of the mutual information, in case you give me a reminder. And uh, of course, you see that all the arrows here are not, are not made. No? I only have this direction, this direction, and also this direction, because this one is a bit more trivial. But what about the other ones, no? Uh, well, actually, this, these ones are basically unknown, and there's been partial, partial progress, progress, let's say, you know. For ground states, we have all the, all the different implications are, you know, we have, we know, we know all the implications, so all these arrows are, let's say, are orange, you no? Know? Everything is known. But for thermal state, no. And for thermal states, we would actually like two things, you no? Know? One is that uh, some way of knowing that an area law implies that there's the existence of an algorithm. 
we don't know this. There's some partial progress in this paper. And we also would like to know, perhaps, that given that, uh, given that a state has an NPO representation, you know, can you, is it close in some way to a thermal state? Um, this is a bit more surprising, but actually, in some cases, it's, it's true. And actually, there's some partial progress uh, recently by a group at Caltech, actually. But anyway, actually, that's not, this is not what I'm going to talk about. This is just to give some context. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is actually the two directions that are known already, you know? So basically, the area law and the, and the, and the algorithm, you no? Know? But we're going to give improved uh, results in, this, in these two directions. No? That's, the, that's the point of this talk. So in what way? First of all, we give a, an area law for the mutual information. And this area law has a better dependence on the temperature. Uh, yeah, so instead of beta, in, instead of beta from the previous slide, I have beta to the two thirds. And I will explain why this may be important. And the other thing that we have is that in one dimension, we have a better algorithm for thermal states. And instead of polynomial time, we have Quasi linear time. And I will explain why this is important, this improvement. Okay, so now let me just get a bit more into the into the actual things that we're gonna talk about. So let me talk first about the, the first area law for thermal states that I showed. So it's from this paper uh, by Wolf et al. It's basically the group of the at MPQ uh, a few years ago, of course. Uh, and the area law is the following, no? the median information is bounded by two times the inverse temperature times the norm of interaction Hamiltonian. No? So this, this, this term here scales like the boundary between A and B, no? two different regions. No? So actually one thing is that the proof of this statement is extremely, extremely simple and I can show it to you in three lines. Uh, it's the only proof I'm gonna show you fully no? uh, because it's the simplest. Uh, so, so the first step is really is a thermodynamic argument. No? It's basically the fact that the free energy, so I have this rho AB, this is a thermal state, and I have this other state, which is rho A tensor rho B, no? which is basically the tensor product of the marginals of the thermal state, no? which are not necessarily thermal states, by the way, of the same Hamiltonian. Um, so we know from just you know, from the fact that the thermal state minimizes the free energy, this is lower than this, right? And then you can rewrite this equation into this. So free energy is basically energy minus entropy, no? and this is again energy minus entropy. No? So you can rearrange this again and put this entropy, you know, in the left hand side and this and this energy in the right hand side and you get this inequality. You see, so basically now you have mutual information bounded by some difference in energies. No? But now the interesting thing is that uh, these Hamiltonians are basically Hamiltonians of the whole system. But since these states are actually the same, except for, you know, except for at the boundary, let's say, most of the terms cancel and you're only left, you can basically upper this by with the contribution that scales like the norm of interaction Hamiltonian, which is again, is the area law, no? So that's it. Um, and I guess one more thing, uh, more of a curiosity maybe, or I mean, not curiosity, but really a contrast with the classical case is that actually in the classical case, the mutual information does not depend on the temperature. And this is why, you know, widely different in the, in the, in the quantum case, no? Is everything clear for, uh, for now? Any questions? Okay. Uh, okay, now I can start introducing our results a bit more in detail. So this is just a restatement of the previous area law with a factor of two missing actually. Uh, so how we how do we improve this this result? Our result our first main result is the following: that in lattices, um, well, actually I, I should have said it before, but this this area law actually holds for any any interaction graph. It doesn't have to be a lattice. It doesn't have to be you know a regular lattice. Uh, you know, it can be anything actually. Uh, but for us, we have to we have to go to lattices, no? So in lattices, this can be improved uh, in the following way. So, so basically, the median information can be upper-bounded by something that depends like beta to the two-thirds. And this term here is, in this term scales like the area of the boundary between A and B, no? And we have some logarithmic factors, actually. But uh, actually, this logarithmic factor hurts you a bit in higher dimensions. But in one dimension, this is a constant, so it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so, we, so basically, we say that this, uh, this, this is an improvement from this, you know, when, when beta is large, at least, no? And actually, we have a similar area law for other measures of correlations, in particular for something called the entanglement purification. That um, I don't really want to explain what it is now, but in case you're interested in this quantity, uh, you know, we also have bounds on this. And I guess intuitively, what this means is that the, the you know, if you, if you look at the lattice, there's a region along the boundary between A and B, now left and right, that scales like beta to the to the gamma, where gamma here is two thirds, no? And basically. Intuitively, what this means is that the correlations between the left side and the right side are clustered around an area that scales like this. 
And another thing we know is that this is this is kind of relatively close to the optimal thing we can derive. And one reason why we know this is that there's a there's, a, there's an example by Gottesman and Hastings uh, in this paper, where they actually have a 1D model in which the mutual information in, in, in a certain um, in a certain parameter range scales like beta to the one fifth actually. So you see, so this so this is a two thirds, which is an improvement over just one. No? But at best, we can get a one fifth here. Okay. I ask something. Yeah. <clears throat> so the improvement means that you can go to lower temperatures, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, so both both these two things hold at any temperatures, but of course, when when beta is large at low temperatures, this is when we get the improvement. Yes. Yeah. So so, so yeah. That's, that's yeah. actually what I what I was waiting for. Uh -huh. what I was waiting next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so somehow this what what we're seeing is that this this improved area low gives us should give us more information about low temperature, no, or some more fine grained information about low temperature. No? And I guess, I guess another interesting thing, another interesting fact uh, that comes out of this area law is that well basically this is we see this as and I think some referees agree that we, this is somehow counterintuitive result. If you think about the analog um, uh, real time evolution, no? so if you think of thermal evolution as, as thermal state as imaginary time evolution, uh, you know you can see how far you can push the analogy with real time evolution. So in particular, there's a result uh, this SIE theorem. And there's a couple of statements that are similar that basically says that uh, when you have unitary evolution, uh, so real time evolution, the entanglement across a cut, so if you start in a product state, the entanglement across a cut scales like time, linearly with time. No? And I guess the intuition from this is just that, you know, it's like Lee Robinson mount, no? you have like a linear light cone. No? Um, right, so somehow we're seeing a, an important difference between real and imaginary time evolution. No? Uh, so I guess what we're trying to guess is how much. Does this area law mean that there's a sense in which correlations in imaginary time spread diffusively? You know, I mean, maybe not diffusively, but sub, sub ballistically, you know, because diffusively will be like a one half here, which we don't quite get. So, you know, is, the question is more like, you know, is there a sense in which imaginary time evolution is a bit like a random walk uh, as opposed to like the linear light cone in real time? I We don't know exactly how to make this precise beyond the area law that we have actually. So, that's just a. Uh, a wild idea I'll leave you I'll leave, I'll leave out there. Okay, so actually now I want to talk a bit about the proof. Uh, it's a bit tricky and actually, I guess it's gonna get a bit more technical now, but um, so first I want to give you a bit of a, a bit of an outline. And hopefully the rest is a bit clear. So the aim and the way we do this is that we have, uh, we construct an MPO approximation, so a tension level approximation to the thermal state, okay? Um, so this like, for instance, there's a very silly way to do this, no? which is you just take the thermal state and you approximate it with the first order of a Taylor expansion, okay, which is identity minus beta h. No? So of course, this, this operator is very simple, and we know that it can be represented very well by a tensor network, no? by an MPO. No? But of course, uh, and then of course, the um, you know if this is the, if this approximation is the case, then this will have a a very small mutual information. No? But of course, this approximation is is completely silly, no, because it only holds for like an incredibly large temperature. No? Uh, temperature that actually scales with system size. No? So, but, so this is silly, but it gives you an idea of what, what, we, what we want to do actually. Uh, so there's a few steps and actually each of the steps contains some, let's say some physical information. So let me go through them. The first part is actually basically isolating the part that we care about. No? So you saw in the picture here that we care about the boundary. No? So somehow we need a way of isolating the boundary near the cut that we care about. No? Once we isolate the Hamiltonian that is around the boundary, we can do a polynomial approximation. No? I mean, of course, it's going to be a better approximation than this one. No? But the idea is that this polynomial approximation is going to have a low degree. And the lower the degree, the, the lower, the smaller the one dimension, meaning the simpler the tensor network is going to be. No? So then the next, the next thing we, we want to show is actually this, no? that given that we have some polynomial approximation, we can construct an MPO with not too large one dimension. No? Uh, and then, now that we have an MPO with a, with a not too large bond dimension along the cut of that separates A and B, then we can show that the states that this, the thermal state actually has a small mutant information. This is all the steps. Uh, and I guess there's, some, there's a difficulty here, which is that you have to, I mean, there's many steps, and in each step you introduce an error. So you have to you choose the parameters in, you know, for instance, the degree of the polynomial and the part that you would care about. Uh, you know, there's a few parameters to play around with, and they have to you know, work out in the right way. But in the end, it all works out. 
And yeah, I guess let me just say that this is actually, <laughs> it was quite long. And in the paper is more than 15 pages as opposed to the three lines that I showed you earlier. And actually I, I want to summarize to you this uh, a little bit because hopefully you find some of the steps uh, interesting by themselves. Okay, so first let me just make precise what we mean by, by caring about the local part, no? So uh, I'm just gonna sketch the proofing 1D, no? So we have a chain, no? And the idea is that we want to, we want to somehow isolate the contribution of the correlations only in the pink part, which is very, very close to the cut that we care about. No? So we divide the Hamiltonian in this way. No? Basically, we have H of S, which is the part that we really care about. And we have the, the connecting parts and then the rest. No? Um, so somehow we want to decompose the thermal state into a product of, of, of the different parts. No? And the way to do this is a little trick, which I think is quite nice. It's called quantum belief propagation uh, from these papers. And what this allows you to do is actually to, to write the thermal state to approximate it as something that is the product of the thing you care about, the thing that is, let's say, far away. So the thing that is in the left and in the right, and then an operator. And this operator, actually, you have some control over it. And basically, it only acts on, on this region, the region that is in the boundary of, of the region you care about. No? Um, oops. Um, OK, so now the nice thing about this is that now we have this decomposition. Now we can actually do a better polynomial approximation, because now we don't have to approximate the whole Hamiltonian. We, can, we only have to approximate this little part. No? How little, you know, is up to the, well, it's, it's, it's going to come out of the proof, let's say. No? And I don't want to tell you exactly what it is, but this is small. No? So now we can do polynomial approximations. Uh, OK, so what polynomial approximation do we use? Actually, you could use a Taylor expansion, but this is not enough, we found. So you need to, you need to do, some, do something a bit more sophisticated. Basically, you need to go to the computer science literature, where they care a lot about polynomial approximations, in particular this paper here. And then find what is the best possible approximation of this function, no? which is the function we want to approximate. No? So what we want is yeah, basically the best, the best polynomial expansion to this function. No? And it turns out that this is actually, I mean, it's kind of funny actually, because uh, it's, it's done in two steps. First, you do a Taylor expansion, and then each of the, and you cut it at some point, and then each of the monomials in the Taylor expansion, you expand it again in terms of, uh, in terms of something called Chebyshev polynomials. No? So it's, it's, it's something very funny actually. It's something like you have, a, a monomial of a certain degree, and you approximate it by a polynomial of a smaller degree, actually, which is, I mean, it's a bit surprising. And actually, the, this expansion has a lot to do with random walks. So we think that, you know, this, 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 we see the connection with random walks that I mentioned earlier, no, with, with the diffusive behavior, let's say, no. Um, yeah, so, so then we use this, basically. Uh, okay, so now we have basically the, the MPO that we care about. And for our, yeah, for a technical reason to do with this operator, we can, this only works for high temperatures actually. So, but this is the approximation. No? We have this product and now we have this, this, this thing here, which is basically a polynomial approximation to this thing, okay? And M is the degree of the polynomial, okay? So the smaller M is, the larger the error is gonna be, but also the smaller the one dimension. No? So there's some trade-off there. So we have this for high temperatures, but then to go to low temperatures, basically it's very simple. No? You just have to take powers. No, because we, if you take powers of this, then you basically decrease the temperature. No? So it's the same, right? Uh, yeah, and basically this is, this is gonna be the approximation for to the thermal state at arbitrary temperatures. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, uh, hopefully this is, this is not too much and hopefully at least you get the, the rough idea. Of, or, yep, sorry. Uh, you're, assuming, you're assuming only locality or only locality, the locality yeah. or the Hamiltonian? Uh, so, so far, uh, basically, homogeneous Hamilton. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be translational invariant. Only locality, yes. Okay. And actually, the only thing I've assumed so, so here, uh, I, the only thing I've assumed, uh, I need locality basically for this to work. Because locality of a Hamiltonian assures me that this operator here is local. No? Uh, uh, the polynomial approximation does not care. Uh, and the, Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And these two, at this HL and HR commute with HS, I guess. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, because yes. basically what you've done is taking out the interaction part. Yes. No. Okay. Good. They, all, they all commute, yes. Hmm. Okay, okay. And they, don't, they, not, they not only commute, but they also don't contribute to the correlations between, between A and B, actually. Uh, or at least you can, the contribution, you don't, yeah, you can sort of isolate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so this is this is our answers for the MPO, no? and so the so the last step now is the following: is basically you know putting a bound, an upper bound, 
on the bond dimension of this operator. And this is actually quite, this is actually quite non-trivial. Um, basically, and basically this operator, let me just tell you what it is, is basically a polynomial of a Hamiltonian, which is local. Now the locality is very important. Uh, and we take, it's a, yeah, it's a polynomial and we take powers of it. And you also have these operators that you have to care about. No? So this is, this is quite a hard calculation, but luckily uh, much of the hard work was already done because actually this kind of, this kind of calculation is already done in the literature about area loss for ground states that I mentioned before. Uh, somehow this is the, is the nice thing we discovered, no? that the results for ground states, you can also apply them to thermal states. So this, this paper, actually this paper is, is, is basically the best proof of an area law that there, there exists at the moment. Has this, has this upper bound, which is, is very ugly and I don't want to explain it, but basically it's an upper bound and one dimension of the, of the MPO. No? So now what you have to do is with this expression, you have, to, you have to make all the choices that you have to do, which the choices are basically, what is the degree of your polynomial approximation? Basically, you have to choose the degree here in this, in, this, in this part. And also here, you have to choose the length of the cut. No? Uh, so you have to choose it. For instance, the length, you have to choose it in such a way that, you know, if it's, too, if it's too small, then the approximation is not very good. But if it's too big, then the bond dimension blows up. No? So you have to choose the right value. No? The, it's a sweet spot. No? So basically, if you choose all the sweet spots for all the parameters, what you end up with is that the bond dimension can be upper bounded by, by this. Which is exponential of the this sorry this all tilde actually means that I don't I'm not writing the logarithmic factors no but it's basically the same expression you saw a few slides earlier with the logarithmic factors. Okay, so now we have that we have an MPO which approximates the thermal state and the one dimension is just this no. Okay, so basically that's almost the whole thing. No? Now we need to argue that given that we have an approximation with a small one dimension, then this has a this this gives you a bound in the mutual information. No? And this is given, I mean, there's a couple of ways of doing this, but one, perhaps the simplest way of understanding it is something called the leaky funnels inequality, in case you know it. And with this, we can actually just, you know, we can actually just argue that if you have a thermal state and this, this is approximated well by an MPO, then um, the middle information is related to the one dimension. And basically with this, uh, we're done. So you have the upper bound on the, on the middle information. Okay, Alvaro, but this two there is coming from where? I mean, because... Oh, the two thirds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so the two thirds is coming from uh, actually uh, in this. Okay. So here, uh, when you when we choose the, um, uh, so here we have an upper bound in the bond dimension. Okay. So there's a few parameters here. Um, for instance, m is the um, is the degree of the polynomial approximation. Okay. L, uh, sorry, uh, q and k and everything that is not l and um, everything that is not l and m are constants actually. So. M is the degree and L is the is the length of the region you care about. Okay. Mm. And so basically you have we have this exponent here. Mm. And basically what happens is that uh, you have to choose M and L in such a way that this whole exponent is, is as small as, as you can. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that actually what you end up with is is basically a dependence, which is well basically you have to choose this L tilde to be like beta to the two thirds. So that's how you get this factor. You see that the boundary is here. No? Mm. Ah, I see. Yeah. So, so that's where it comes from. from. It's from a choice. Of, you know, basically, you you want to optimize this. Um, and then, yeah, basically, you have to optimize because you know, if you take a polynomial that is um, has two large degree, then m is very large, so it blows up. Mm. And if you take l to be very small, meaning that the region that you choose to care about is too small, then you also the error also blows up. No? Mm -hmm. So it's somehow, somehow like a funny sweet spot you know, here. Um, yeah. And actually one thing, uh, so, for, so actually another thing I can say is that from the, um, the, the, the problem here is that you have M here and you also have it here in the, well, here, in, here not in the exponent, in the, in the base. And actually this means that this is how you get the logarithmic factors. So the logarithmic factors will go away if you didn't have this. Uh, so actually this bound is not optimal, but it's the best one we know actually. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, well, I wanted to say this later, but actually we think that this can be improved to beta one half uh, by doing, can be. doing ah. something better here. So the whole thing, thing is, <clears throat> is based on this truncation, right? And, the, and this replacing this uh, power, this polynomial by Chebyshev. So you could use yeah. another polynomial, you could get something else. Sorry, what was the last thing you said? Sorry. No, you are uh, substituting, I mean, you're doing the Taylor expansion and mm -hmm. taking the polynomial x to some power by Chebyshev. Yeah. And then this is how you get, but you could use another approximation. Yeah, so yeah, so, case, yeah. So for instance, yeah, if we have a better, a better result than the one here, then we will have a better approximation, yes. 
Okay. So that's, yeah, that could be another thing, yes. Because I, I don't know if this is optimal, actually. Yeah. I mean, we, are, we actually don't know whether any results is, any of the results we use are optimal. So, so this is room for improvement. Yeah. Um, okay, so actually, that's that's how I, now. If there are no more questions, I want to move on to the next part, which also shares some features with what I just said. So that was the the algorithm, no? So I told you that we have area law and we have also algorithm, no? And the difference is basically that you care about uh, different things, no? So in the algorithm, of, in the algorithm, of course, you want to approximate the thermal state uh, with an MPO. But now, in the previous in the previous part, I only said that we care about a single cut, no? Basically, this cut. And we don't care about the one I mentioned here at all. Like it doesn't matter for the meter information. But now, of course, because we want an algorithm, we care about the one dimension at every single site in the Hamiltonian, no? At every single partition, no? And and because of this, actually, we end up with a result for one dimension only, no? I suppose for every, this this is this thing I said earlier was for arbitrary dimensions, but it's only for one dimension. Uh, so that's the question, no? Can we approximate an, uh, the thermal state with an MPO, a small one dimension across the lattice? And this is the main result, no? So we can. So we can construct an MPO with an error epsilon in P norm. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, and this epsilon is such that the bond dimension of this MPO is the following. It's this expression here. So it's e to the something complicated with logs. And basically, well, the main takeaway of this thing is that this is this is actually exponential of the square root of log n, no? So this is, uh, you know, as long as epsilon is not super small, this is actually much smaller than than uh, any polynomial in n. No? So if epsilon is one over a polynomial in n, this is much smaller than any polynomial in n. No? It's basically it's, it's subpolyn this has a subpolynomial scaling. No? That's what this is called. And also this is the case as long as beta is not too small. No? So if beta, I mean, of course, is, if beta is like a linear in system size, then of course this is exponential. No? Uh, but in any case, yeah, this is uh, in, in when beta is constant and when epsilon is not too small, then we have uh, as a polynomial. No? So what this means is that given you have a description of, a, of the MPO, this one dimension, then you can use other results from, from MPOs and show that this means that there exists an algorithm uh, where the com time complexity of the algorithm is basically the one dimension of the MPO times n. And n just comes from the fact that you have to sort of, you know, you have to do the algorithm in, in sequence, no? In all, in all sides, no? So, so it's, it's always going to scale like the system size, no? Uh, so this is what we call quasi-linear, no? Basically a linear term and something that scales uh, slower than a polynomial, no? So this improves a lot for one dimension in the previous results, uh, which were from this paper by Andrew Molnar and other people from the group at MPQ, actually, where they had uh, only a polynomial. And the polynomial actually, um, you know, scales with the temperature, no? So actually for low temperatures, this is very bad. For, and for, yeah, for low temperatures, even for beta scaling like log n, we get a much better, uh, much better performance. Okay, so what is the significance of this algorithm? Also compared to, compared to the basically, you know, this to compare to the numerical literature actually, you know, because we have a rigorous proof. No? Excuse me. Um, so there's a lot of um, heuristic algorithms. No, we be heuristic meaning that they don't have a rigorous proof of how they work. Which seem to work very well, no? These these are three of the more important ones, and they seem to well, they work very well, and they seem to work in quasi-linear time, no? So now what we have is basically that our algorithm, which is a bit is a bit different to all of these. Uh, you know, it might not, it might not, might not beat them in practice because this this we actually haven't implemented it, and you know, in the end, it's going to depend on the constants and other things, no? But basically, the, what we've shown is that there's an algorithm that has quasi-linear performance, no? So in a sense, this already justifies the fact that other algorithms also have quasi-linear performance, no? Uh, because but now we now we have a better handle on the actual theoretical complexity of the problem, no? So it so it justifies these previous all the previous algorithms, no? Uh, yeah, because there exists at least at least one that performs very well, no? And for higher dimensions, let me just quickly comment that again the best result is the following, no? By Molnar et al., which has a polynomial time algorithm. Uh, and yeah, this is the scaling from the previous slide, no? and we couldn't improve it for, for higher dimensions. No? Maybe other way, other techniques will be useful for, for this. Um, okay, so let me just quickly describe how, how we do it and also how it relates to the, to the previous proof of the thermal area law. So the way we do this is, is, is relatively simple. No? Basically, you have a Hamiltonian in one dimension, so a chain, and you divide it into chunks or into blocks of a certain length, and this length L0. No? So you see that you know we have 
all these all these pieces of the Hamiltonian. So now what you do is, given that you have the Hamiltonian divided into chunks, you take uh, the um, so let me just yeah, basically you take um you take a Taylor expansion. Now it's a Taylor expansion. It's not the fancy expansion from before. The Taylor expansion is enough. You take a Taylor expansion of the thermal state at one little bit, at one little block, no? And you sort of multiply together all these contributions from all the blocks. And actually, you have to do it in a way that is a bit funny. It's like first you multiply with a with a negative temperature, and then you multiply with a with a positive temperature, and so on. So you're sort of you're making like some sort of break of the of these approximations, no? Uh, and intuitively, this works because all these operators, if you multiply them together, uh, you end up with something that you know if the Hamiltonian is commuted. Um, it will be exactly the thermal state, no? But of course, these Hamiltonians don't commute with each other, no? But they almost commute because they only overlap at the boundary, no? So the bigger the block, the better the approximation is going to be, basically. Um, okay. So what is the method to show that this this braiding works? Um, actually, basically, it's, it's just using the something called the thermal Lee Robinson bound, no? Because basically, this this the fact that the fact that this approximates this. Has to do with the well. It ends up having to do with the Lee Robinson bound with locality, no? And there's a problem with this, which is that the Lee Robinson bound actually for imaginary time, uh, not for real time, like the one you've probably seen before, only converges above a threshold temperature. Uh, so it means that you know basically it only works about, uh, for a beta that is not too large. Um, so this is a problem. There's a problem with an easy solution actually, no? Because we have to do the same thing as before, no? Basically, you have to you have to you have to do this chain of operators that approximate your thermal state for a beta that is small, and then you take powers. And in these powers, of course, you increase the bond dimension, but uh, in a way that is controlled. No? Uh, I mean, this statement. This, well, this is here. I'm just describing a technical statement that we wanted that we needed about the, the operator norms, but don't yeah, don't focus too much on this part. This is that we have to take powers to approximate. No? And once we approximate, we use the the previous result again no? because now. We have this operator, and actually the bond dimension across every cut is going to be related to the, the degree of the polynomial expansion no? of the Taylor expansion here to this, and also to the to the length of the of the chunks. No, so you, so now you have two another two free parameters. No, one is the length, another one is the polynomial approximation. No? So again, you have to choose this in the right way, no? So you have this, this ugly looking bound that I showed you earlier, no? Where you have the two free parameters again, M and L. And again, you have to tune, you have to play around with them, no? And in the end, what you get is the following, no? That the bond dimension is superbounded by this. Uh, again, uh, I mean, let me repeat again that, of course, this, is, uh, this now depends on system size, which it didn't before. And the reason is that the problem we are we're doing now is much harder, no? Because now, we have an approximation across the whole the whole Hamiltonian. It's not just across a single cut, no. Um, yeah. So and this is basically the the result that I uh, yeah that I described earlier. No, this is the one dimension. No, and again it comes out of exactly the same ingredient of area loss for ground states that I described earlier. No, so it's quite nice that you can actually just take this take this uh, result and apply it here. No. Uh, I mean it's, it's not straightforward because you have to do all the work from before. No, about the rubbing some bounds and so on, but uh but it's nice that we can use it and then yeah so given this then you just have to multiply by n and you have an algorithm no? you have the perform the the time the time complexity of the algorithm no? so this is the quasi linear performance okay uh yeah so that's that's all i have to say about the algorithm just remember that this is this is more or less case like n no? um okay and let me just uh, make a comment about an important future question which is actually something I, I mentioned before, no? In the in, my, in the beginning, no? When I was making the comparison with the situation uh, between the situation of ground states and the situation of uh, thermal states, no? So one thing that we would really like, actually, and will, I think it will have many interesting applications for thermal states and also beyond thermal states, is the following: for quantum mixed states, what we would like is that uh, an area law for some quantity, and of course, a quantity that has to measure correlations in your system. We imply the existence of an algorithm, no? or at least the existence of an MPO with a small bond dimension. So for ground states, we know this. No? We know that an area law for the Renyi entropy implies the existence of an MPS with a small bond dimension. For mixed states, we don't know anything, basically. We know very little. Uh, so yeah, basically, we're working on this now at, uh, at MPQ. And we have, uh, I mean, we don't, yeah, we haven't really made much progress so far, but I can tell you what we've, something we've done. 
which is that we are we're defining uh, where we're managing to to prove um, different area loss, different thermal area loss for other quantities. No, so one problem with emitting information is that it's actually kind of hard to write uh, any generalizations of emitting information, but there are some. No, and basically what we're doing is we're trying to to find the area loss for quantities that generalize the emitting information. Uh, so for instance, there's a famous one which is called Dmax. Uh, this appears a lot in uh, in, in basically in quantum information and in quantum channel theory, you know, it's very important. And we have a thermal area law for it. And the hope here is that basically, you know, given that we have error on this quantity, hopefully this together with some non-trivial idea from quantum information, we still, we don't really know what it is. So if you have any ideas or any suggestions, well, that would be great. It'd be great to know, no? Maybe something to do with quantum communication, quantum channel theory, you know, so something quite different actually, possibly quite different looking. Hopefully something like this actually yields the result that we, that we want, no? Uh, yeah, so we're working on this uh, with uh, Samuel Scarlett and Yorgos Tillaris and Ignacio Sirac. And actually, just let me let me quickly remark one thing, which is that uh, one thing we know for sure is that uh, this way of defining the random mutual information doesn't doesn't work, no? So you see that the usual mutual information is defined as S of uh, of, of of A, the entropy of region A plus the entropy of region B minus the entropy of the whole thing, no? So one thing you can do is you can put alphas. In the in the different entropies, no, and then just take this this combination of the running entropies. So actually, this this definitely doesn't work for for a bunch of reasons having to do with uh, well, with problems with this quantity actually. Um, yeah, so you have to you have to work a bit harder to to define these things actually. Um, yep, and I think that's that's it. So let me just conclude and basically summarize what I've said. Basically, two things, no. So we have, uh, we have approximations of thermal states with MPOs and with, of course, PEPOs for higher dimensions. And for, for a single cut, uh, we have a, a given approximation which gives the thermal area alone. Uh, and actually, we, can, we have a conjecture, which is that uh, it has to do with the fact that, you know, this, well, with our intuition that maybe this, this uh, imaginary time evolution has to do with a random walk. And our conjecture is that actually the best possible scaling uh, Actually goes, and I guess one interesting thing about this result is that it's counterintuitive, no? And uh, hopefully this this shows this shows or this you know you can get away from this is that there's actually a you know some more work to do about the structure of quantum thermal states, no? Because somehow there's there's some things that maybe we don't know, and there's a lot of things to improve, no? And then the other thing I said is that for all cuts, uh, we can improve on pre previous results and actually achieve a, as a polynomial one dimension. And a cross-linear algorithm no? for one dimension. No? So this actually, this I think this will be, this could be quite relevant for the for the numerical implementations no? of, of, of tensor network algorithms no? for thermal states. And just a summary of the techniques actually. So one is quantum belief propagation. Uh, then we use some identity switching norms. Then the minor timely Robinsons. Also the one dimension of polynomial of polynomials of the Hamiltonian. So actually many of these things have have been used in 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 different problems, no, in, in previous problems having to do with thermal states or with the ground states, no. So, I mean, hopefully, you know, uh, it would be nice if one of you has a problem which maybe can be solved with one of these techniques that I've, that I've mentioned, no. I mean, if there's anything, I'm happy to, to discuss this later. Um, yeah, and actually with this, I'll be uh, just concluding with the archive reference and thank you all for listening. Okay, thanks, uh, Alejandro. Uh, there is plenty of time for questions. I see the chat is there's some stuff in the chat. Uh, oh, this question in the chat, sorry. So he says, can you put back the definition of running? Oh, maybe just. <laughs> sorry. Well, oh, it's okay. asking for the definition of running entropy. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, this mean, okay. The definition of running entropy is somewhere here. Uh, is this? <laughs> And for alpha equals one, actually, this is the von Neumann entropy, which is it's not obvious from the expression, but uh, you have to take uh, some limit. Did you, did you mention the, the, the approximate, the, the, the commutation of the Hamiltonians, which is only approximate? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how can that explode? Well, like, well, when would that assumption would, would break down? What, what assumption, sorry? You, you, you said that the, the, the commuting of the Hamiltonians is mm -hmm. approximate. So when you increase the block, 
mm-hmm. that that approximation is good. And mm-hmm. I, w- I was wondering when could that not work? When could that not work? Uh, the, the approximate commutation when actually they, yeah. you know. Okay, so there's a, there's an issue that I think I mentioned it in the context of the algorithm, no? So here. Yeah, so what I say is that, of course, the, so these blocks, sorry, one second, I have to plug in my laptop. Yeah, sorry. Um, so these blocks, yeah, so these blocks, you can define a Hamiltonian on this block, no? And what I say is that the Hamiltonians on the different blocks approximately commute, right? Um, and they approximately commute because the, the commutator basically has to do with the boundary, no? Which doesn't scale with the size of the block. The problem in this construction is that the bigger the block, the larger the bond dimension of the approximation. So for us, it doesn't work to take blocks arbitrarily large, if that was your question. Uh, ah, OK, OK. OK, I get it. Yeah. So you have to choose the sweet spot no, of like a large. Actually, in the end, this L0 uh, actually scales like a logarithm of system size uh, when you do the whole calculation. Uh, and you cannot take it smaller or larger because this then something else blows up. So, thanks. Yeah, what's happened? I was wondering uh, if you were to take a Hamiltonian for a spin chain, imagine, mm-hmm. I mean, the IC model or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, how, I mean, what this result tells you if you were to compute the, the thermal states mm-hmm. for that IC model, let's say? I mean, Right, you you would construct the the density matrix. I mean the thermal density matrix for yeah. this IC model, I suppose, and then uh, this uh, improvement will tell you something about the ter- corresponding thermal state of icing. Or uh, what or improvements? You... <clears throat> yeah, suppose you take IC model, the usual IC model, yeah. critical or non-critical, mm-hmm. and there you will compute the thermal density matrix that you can do and compute the entropy. Uh, so uh, this uh, improvement, you will tell you something about about it, or um, so? You, so the for, so you mean, for instance, the area law improvement or the algorithm? Or... Yes, yes, no, the improvement. Yes, the, the improvement. The, the area law. I um, let me see. I mean, I guess the area law is more like a structural. It's a structural property with which doesn't by itself doesn't have computational consequences. Let's say. You know? mm-hmm. I, I guess we would like to know whether uh, an improved area law gives a better algorithm, but this connection is missing, no? Like I said, so. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just wondering about uh, comparisons with models. I mean, models that you can actually compare. Oh, actually, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, good. So actually, okay. So one funny thing I, I've been finding, we've been finding in the literature, and actually we didn't know this when we started, is that, uh, well, for many models, actually, this mutual information scales very differently. So for I think for free fermions. There are some results that tell you that this scales like log of beta, actually. Uh-huh. And as also, I know there's a paper by a guy called Thomas Bartel where he, he, I think he has some some argument to do with CFTs, and also there he finds a log of beta actually, or log of beta plus one. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah. So it's not. Uh, so I guess in maybe more simple models, actually, this scales very differently. You know? Mm-hmm. But in general, we know that we cannot improve this too much, no, because we have this example of, of, of this mutual information that goes like beta to the one fifth. No? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's possible. Like, I mean, one thing, one possibility is that actually the models that have this kind of scaling, like beta to the one fifth, or maybe even beta to the two thirds, mm-hmm. maybe are models that are very complicated in the sense of complexity theory. No? Yeah. Maybe they're the ones that actually have to do with proofs of QMA hardness or something like this. Uh-huh. And not with yeah, the this physical, no, like I like some free fermions or something. No? So. Well, there is this Hamiltonian with, with traditional invariant the, based, based on this uh, Motkin paths, which uh, the Hamiltonian is local and, the, and already the ground state has a volume law. Right. So, okay. So, that would, right. that would be, okay. So, actually, we, oh, we, we didn't look at this, but this will be, okay, this will be a very good, a very good thing to check, actually, because. For basically the way you the way you do this the way you calculate this from this paper is just so this paper only has results for our ground states no, but if you take beta to be very large so it's getting like n, then the mutual information has to do with the entropy of the ground state no. So basically, if you understand the gap and the and the and entanglement in the ground state, then maybe you can say something about the the mutual information at very low temperatures no. So maybe, so okay so actually in this model it would be interesting to check what happens. 
I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is by Ramis and Peter Shore, I think. So, yeah, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, yeah, we didn't do this. Yeah, we should do this. Mm -hmm. yes. And there is also this uh, the rainbow model that we discussed a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, in this one, uh, that's even more simple, actually. Yeah, <laughs> these things, yes. I don't know because in the model it seemed to me that the coupling at the mean the middle maybe is very large or or not. Yeah, it's the highest, it's the highest, right. and then goes down towards the edges, and the, there is a volume law. There. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, so I guess I wonder if if this if the fact that this coupling is much larger is a problem in the sense that maybe the bound becomes a bit a bit more trivial mm -hmm. in that case. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but here you are you are not assuming that the Hamiltonian is gapped, right? It can be any Hamiltonian, right? It, well, it can be any, but I guess what we're assuming is that the interaction, the local interactions, the norm of the local interactions is bounded by a constant. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah, constant yeah. Uh, can appear here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the hash thing, you also assume that the, the, the couplings uh, do not blow up. That's one assumption. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here, here's the same, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, this rainbow thing is bounded. I mean, no problem with that. OK. It's also bounded. Yes. Okay, in that case, that, I guess that would be interesting. Right? If he has volume, because the one the good thing about this paper is that it, there's a volume law and the gap that closes uh, relatively slowly. So if any model any model that has two things, these two things is going to give us some interesting behavior here. So okay, nice. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's yeah. I think that'll be worth looking at actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, some more question. Okay, then uh, if not, uh, thank you very much, Alvaro, for for your talk. And uh, okay, we close the the session. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.